Hello, everyone, and welcome to the France Startup Conference 2022. My name is Adam. I am the founder of Startup Network Europe, uh, speaking from Dublin right now in Ireland. And uh, we make online conferences for startups, such as the one happening today. Uh, we make face-to-face -face events like the Paris Startup Meetup 2022, which we will do next month. And uh, we focus on communities. Um, so we've made a Startups in France WhatsApp group, which I will share in the chat box in a moment. Uh, we're also moving to face-to-face -face events and we'll do a lot of them next year. Uh, folks, thanks for coming. The plan for today is very simple. Um, this is a 90 minute event with 20 different speakers in 90 minutes. Um, these include French ecosystem leaders, uh, French founders and CXOs uh, in France, but we also have many entrepreneurs in the United States, uh, such as in Silicon Valley. Um, we also have French VCs and angel investors, and finally, international scale-ups, uh, which you see to the right of the screen. Um, now, our sponsors for today, before we begin, um, this event would not be possible without them. Uh, Freshworks for Startups is our first one. Um, they make business software that people love to use, uh, purpose-built for IT, customer support, sales and marketing teams. Their products include CRM, Live Chats, and Help Desk. And uh, they are headquartered in California, originally from India, and they have uh, over 56,000 customers at the moment. And uh, as an attendee of this conference, uh, you can actually apply for free credits up to $10,000. And next up, we have Amplitude. Uh, they are the digital optimization system. Um, they have a trademark behavioral graph uh, innovation where they sort through millions of pieces of data uh, to instantly find patterns of custom behavior and uh, they can predict outcomes and adapt experiences uh, through this data collection process that they have. Um, and again with them they have an Amplitude Startup Scholarship Program uh, which I can share in the chat box in a moment. And finally, we have Twilio, our third sponsor, a cloud communications platform used by millions of startups to engage with billions of uh, people across the world. And uh, software developers using their APIs uh, can make and receive phone calls, text messages, and other communications. And attendees of this uh, conference can apply for the Twilio Startups program, which has free credits and other resources. Uh, now, folks, we have a, a page, uh, startupnetwork.eu slash France, where you can see a list of our speakers, our sponsors, and also our WhatsApp group and upcoming events. Now we're going to begin. So our first section will have uh, two quick speeches from Maya, uh, Managing Director of France Digitale, which is the leading startup association in Europe. And we'll also have Anne Charlotte, uh, who is General Manager of EdTech France. Um, before we begin, uh, I want to give a quick uh, introduction to the French startup ecosystem. Uh, according to dealroom.co, uh, there are at least 19,000 verified startups in France at the moment. Um, the figure you see at the bottom is venture capital in France. You can see in 10 years, in five years, there has been a huge increase in venture capital funding. Even if you compare 2020 with uh, 2021, uh, we went from 5.3 billion euros to 12.5 billion euros in just one year. So. There are challenges at the moment now in 2022, but in general, we see a very strong growth in France, which is really, really good. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, Maya, um, welcome to the conference. Uh, it's great to hear from you. Hi, Adam, thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce this event today with you. So uh, I have a mission is to, to give you an insight of the French tech ecosystem in two minutes. So it's gonna be very short. So I think that I'm gonna give you two objective and two needs of the French tech ecosystem. Uh, first of all, so Adam, you already gave some figures, but um, EY has published a study today that shows that France is the, is the most attractive destination for investors in Europe, ahead of the UK and the Germany. So I think this is a very powerful sign out for the ecosystem. Uh, however, and observing the market, we are now expecting uh, a slowdown in fundings after the record year of 2021. Um, so here comes my, my second adjective for the French tech ecosystem. So I would say it's a, a resilient and strong ecosystem. And I know that maybe the, the upcoming months are gonna be a bit difficult for some entrepreneurs, but we are very confident about the fact that it's also an opportunity to show strengths. But in order to do so, we have two big needs. Uh, the first one would be the, the talented people. Uh, definitely for the startup, it's uh, for more than 60% of them is the first pain point when they are 
when they are growing. So France really needs to, to make a lot of efforts to train, attract and retain the, the right person that are able to help our companies to scale. And second point, what France needs is Europe. So more precisely, a European single market where our companies could face one regulation and not 27 at today. Um, and beside talents, we definitely need some revenue. So through Europe, we are expecting some public procurement for the startups. And this is basically two of the first, first fight that we have at France Digital. To give you an insight in two minutes, I think it's uh, I think it summarizes everything. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Maya. And next up, we have Anne Charlotte. Yes, hi everyone. Um, so at EdTech France, we are gathering a bit more than uh, 400 EdTech uh, startups. So I will try to give you insight on this specific uh, area of the tech industry. So actually in France, the EdTech scene is covering uh, three sub-markets, the K-12 market for primary schools, middle schools, high schools, the higher education markets, entrepreneurs that are selling to business school and universities, and the lifelong learning market if you are selling products to a big corporate. So basically, we call EdTech all companies that are inventing tools and services to improve learning whenever you are in France. And it's a booming, booming market um, in our country, but uh, also in the rest of uh, the world, especially in the US and in India, because everyone, uh, schools and uh, companies, uh, we all had to transform uh, because of COVID and to invest in uh, EdTech products uh, to keep uh, learning and to keep teaching. And uh, to give you numbers, if we focus on France, we have a very innovative market with almost 500 tech companies representing more than um, 10,000 uh, jobs and generating more than 1 billion euro uh, revenues. We have uh, famous uh, scale-ups such as uh, Open uh, Classroom uh, 360 Learning, but still we need to consolidate the market as 50% um, of the French tech, uh, they were created less than five years ago. So we have a super strong uh, potential to go abroad in a French speaking Africa. And we are very proud to have a lot of uh, women uh, funding members of, um, of uh, companies in the tech industry, a bit more than uh, for the rest of the French tech. We have actually 33% of the funding teams in France uh, in um, the tech industry that are uh, co-funded by women and men compared uh, to only 24% for the rest of the French tech. So yeah, it's a booming uh, industry and we raised around 500 million uh, euros in 2021. It will be hard to do better in 2022 as we all know it, but uh, we, uh, we are still uh, accelerating and uh, hoping for the best for um, the rest of the year. Okay, and Charlotte, thank you very much. And next up, we have a 10 minute conversation between uh, Jan, uh, CEO of Scaleway and between uh, Roxanne, the director of Station F. Um, so I'll just pin you both one second. And Jan, could you quickly explain what Scaleway is? And Roxanne, you can explain Station F, please. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, so Scaleway is a cloud operator um, based in Paris, but operating all across Europe. And uh, we typically are what uh, uh, you know of from the large tech companies in California, uh, typically AWS or Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure. Well, we are very much that uh, in a very humble and regional way. Great. And Roxanne? Yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, so Station F is the world's biggest startup campus based in Paris. Um, we have over 50,000 square meters of workspace and housing space for entrepreneurs. Over 1,000 companies from around the world uh, work on our campus, taking part in 30 different programs. So we have some corporate programs, we have some university programs, we have some programs um, like Entrepreneur First that are pure ecosystem plays. Um, and so essentially it's for early stage companies uh, really trying to facilitate their, their first few years of existence. Great, and you were opened by uh, President Emmanuel Macron in 2017, I believe. Yes, and we're celebrating yeah. five years this summer. <laughs> well, congratulations. Um, so guys, look, it's really good to have both of you here. Um, yeah, and I know that in addition to being CEO of Scaleway, you're also an angel investor and serial entrepreneur and advisor. Um, so my question for you both is, um, according to Deal Room, as I mentioned, um, French startups and scale-ups raised 12.5 billion euros in 2021, which was more than double the um, figure from one year before. Um, so in your opinion, uh, what explains this growth? 
Roxanne, do you want to start? I'll let you start, Jan. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, well, I've been an entrepreneur in Paris for the past 20 years. I still consider myself an entrepreneur, um, but I would like to, to raise uh, awareness on the fact that France was trailing, uh, has been behind in terms of creating startups and scale-ups and structuring the ecosystem. So we've come a long way in the past 20 years. 20 years ago, when I started my first company, I was literally alone. There was no such thing as an ecosystem. Uh, some people knew each other from the web 1.0, uh, which quickly uh, uh, dissolved. Uh, but essentially, 20 years ago, we had nothing. So it's been a long way. And recently, our government has you know, taken stock and also realized that that needs to be structured. Uh, we can also go back to 2013, where the ecosystem was almost annihilated through taxation, but that was, uh, that was fixed um, because, again, we have lobbies, we have structures like France Digital that did the work to make it uh, sustainable over time. So it's been a long way. We're in the game. My feeling is that we are not out of the water yet. Um, and, um, you know, everything we're doing is just what everybody else is doing. Startups need funding. You need a full sequence from seed funding to, um, to Series E. You need an exit market. So France is in the game. Definitely, we're on the map. Uh, we have beautiful, wonderful companies, creative spirits, um, ambitious people driving those companies. Um, we don't have an exit market. So that is the worry that I have right now with all these unicorns uh, floating around. So who's going to buy them? Because investors, they need a return on their investment. Um, so let's keep working uh, on the copy to make sure that France creates a, a virtuous circle out of these companies, which do represent the future of the economy. Thank you, Jan and Roxanne. Um, continuing with that, what is good about the French startup ecosystem? What can be improved? Super. Well, I think I couldn't uh, do any better than agree with uh, with what Yen just said. I think France has come a long way. I think we are on the map. Um, I think also there's been kind of a few different elements that have really pushed this ecosystem forward over the last few years. I think there's been a huge cultural shift. Um, you guys can hear it. I'm not originally from France. I'm from the US. I moved out here 13 years ago. Um, at the time, people were not interested in working for startups. They were interested in working for the state, for big corporations. Uh, today, there's a massive movement. People want to work for uh, startups. They want to innovate. They want to build things. So I think that's a big cultural shift. I also think geopolitics has played a huge role over the last five years. Um, we saw traditional ecosystems uh, kind of be a little bit less friendly um, to people who want to create companies. So a lot of entrepreneurs turned away from the US, turned away from the UK. Um, and also we had Macron kind of rise to the forefront with a very pro-business um, kind of uh, discourse that actually, even though the ecosystem, I mean, he didn't just arrive and everything changed. It was really just, we had finally someone to really represent what was, what was happening on the ground. Um, and then I think there's a lot of stuff that's happened on an infrastructure level. Uh, players like Station F, but obviously not just Station F, um, have really contributed to making it easier to set up and run a company. So I think a lot of that has contributed to the change. And I have to agree with what Yen just said. I think exits is a huge concern. Um, we have the unicorns. We have to worry about what's going to happen next. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, very cool. My question then, you have a very, very cool feature on your website uh, called Feature 40. So Station F is home to over a thousand startups uh, and you feature 40 of them on your website. Uh, they've all raised less than a million euros. They all have some kind of traction. And I love that because you never see that in the startup world, a very standardized um, set of pitches. Uh, why do you think that is important? Um, why did you do this initiative? Super. So actually, um, so Future 40, for people who are less familiar with it, is it's the 40 uh, kind of up and coming companies, seed stage and pre-seed stage companies from Station F. So essentially the ones that we want investors to watch. It's our top 4%. The reason that we do a standardized format, which is not unique to Station F, we didn't invent it. We actually uh, copied what a lot of other people are doing, is really to facilitate things for companies and for investors. Investors don't want to spend a ton of time going through a deck. They want to just be able to filter really quickly and be able to see what jumps out. 
Um, so making this format and helping the companies bring to the forefront what could really differentiate them is why we use this standardized format. And it makes it easier for the investors and hopefully also for the companies to get that funding. Thank you. And continuing with the subject of funding, Jan, um, I'm doing a poll now to see how many people here are looking for funding. Um, so as an angel investor, what is your number one piece of advice for anyone looking for funding? So I'm going to contextualize that to what's happening today. I'm going to use the B words. So either bubble or business. Uh, Maya said it earlier, right? We need more of Europe because Europe is a large you know, playground. Uh, and we need to leverage that to generate business. Uh, of course, we can also tackle the US or, or the Asian market uh, or even African market or even South American. But the point is, right now, we're sort of seeing a bubble because there's been a lot of inflation in the rounds um, and people might have gotten high on it. We need to make sure that entrepreneurs are really, really focusing on their key metrics on their, on their business metrics. In other words, how do we ensure that what we're doing actually adds value, uh, actually is transacted in a way that is connected to the real economy, the business. In other words, if I charge for a product or service, then in return, I provide additional value to my clients. These are the fundamentals that we tend to forget when we talk about fundraising. So fundraising will happen when your business metrics make sense and are appealing to investors. Investors have invested a lot recently and they might actually you know, not get their returns because of the inflation. So because of these big cycles, nowadays, what makes more sense is to actually depend less on funding and more on metrics. The startup world is designed after what Silicon Valley created which is a massive financial organization. Silicon Valley is mostly that. Silicon Valley is mostly financing on top of tech. So keeping in mind that Europe is not like Silicon Valley, uh, Europe is not like the US, it's fragmented and all that. We need to be extra careful about what fundraising will do to us. Um, and of course, there's gonna be scarcity of funding because of the temporary uh, heating up of the market. So therefore, my advice is to make sure that the words lean and the KPIs are back in, into fashion. We need to make sure that our businesses, our small uh, emerging startups or bigger startups get lean and manage to generate actual return for the business to become more sustainable and less dependent on capital, which as we've seen over the past 50 years, goes through very, very steep cycles. So the worst thing for a company is to raise funding and then not be able to raise again because they've, they've actually gotten the cash at a moment where the valuation was disconnected from reality. So to me, that is the one single advice, which is to be connected to the business reality of the product or service that is being delivered. Thank you, Jan. And a question for both of you. So Jan, um, you founded, co-founded, or joined a number of startups. Um, Roxanne, you have probably more exposure to startups than anyone else in France. Um, my question is, is it better to be a founder or a co-founder in your experience? Well, I've, I've done all the formats. Uh, being a single founder is terrible. Uh, you need to be challenged by someone uh, with whom you have shared uh, and aligned interests. That is essential. Uh, so being alone is very difficult. And that's why the, the combination of having a, a business and a technical founder uh, on equal terms is very important. Now, equal terms is very difficult because that needs to uh, require two people 100% vested into the, the new venture. Uh, and we often don't talk about this, but also have alignment of the spouses and partners if those founders are in couple, because that ends up being a formation of four people, right? Uh, the point is that being an entrepreneur is extremely intensive, extremely intense, um, and you easily get consumed. So making sure that you have checks and balances in the founding team so at least two founders, three is a little more complex, 
um, and having alignment verbalized in terms of what are the expectations, how much time are we giving ourselves to prove that the business can fly? When do we say stop? All these things are essential for, for it to work, at least in the early stage. Thank you, Jan. And Roxanne, do you see more success with founders or co-founders? Jan is so wise. I have to, I have to agree with everything he says. Um, yeah, I think what we see at Station F, I mean, we tend to give a lot of priority to um, multiple founder teams. I think it's just being a founder is such a difficult job. You have to wear so many hats. It's really hard for one person to be able to manage and do everything well. Um, and we tend to like complementary founders. I think there's the, the trio that Airbnb developed that everybody has been trying to replicate. I don't think it's necessarily the only model that works. Um, so we're, we've seen a lot of um, uh, very different variations. So I don't think everybody needs to be tech, design, business uh, necessarily. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really interesting is to also see what is the relationship for the founders, previous relationship, how long have they known each other, have they worked on something before, and as Jan said, there will come a time where, where uh, the relationship really includes everything in their lives, and I think that's something that we've seen a lot of, is people come to me, um, not only when the company's doing well, but when the company's not doing well, and there's a lot of personal elements that go into that, and usually there tends to be um, an infliction point, I think, when somebody lives um, a key moment outside of the workplace uh, that kind of creates an imbalance between the different founders. Somebody feels that they're getting more personal time or personal advancement in their life than the other founder, and it kind of creates a, a very weird dynamic for them. So I would tell founders uh, that, are, that are just setting out, it's stuff that you should talk about early on um, and put on paper. That's my advice that I give to everyone because they think they're best friends. They know each other. They're aligned. What could possibly go wrong? And five years from now, you're not going to remember what you said those first days, and it's good to have something in writing. Yeah. Okay, well, look, Jan, Roxanne, thank you very much. Um, it was a great conversation. Um, so we'll go on now to our rapid fire talks, uh, where we have two minute pieces of advice. Um, I suppose before I do that, folks, I did do a couple of polls. So I will show you the results of those polls now. Um, first of all, in terms of investment, 54% uh, of you in the audience are looking for investment. So I would encourage you to visit startupnetwork.eu slash France and uh, look at the venture capitalists who are speaking in this event. Uh, perhaps um, they invest in, uh, in your area. And what growth is your startup at? Well, we have a very good mix from ideation all the way to Series C. Um, I suppose I can share the other uh, poll results later. We can go on to the speakers now. And our first speaker will be uh, David, uh, director at Key Search. And everybody in this section has the same question. What is the most interesting challenge that your startup has overcome? Thanks, Adam. So I think I'm in a unique position to be the, the first of the rapid fire talks that doesn't actually have a startup. Um, but I've worked with hundreds of startups. And so I'm thinking about what's the one of the greatest challenges. And Maya mentioned this, you know, right away in the beginning of her talk, saying that talent is one of the greatest challenges. Um, something like 60% of startups are saying that's a big challenge. So I wanted to share three things with you that um, I've seen in my work that's really helped startups overcome this talent challenge, or at least get a lot better at it, especially when it comes to hiring uh, uh, leaders, leaders for the organization. So uh, first and foremost, I think you really need to know what you want. So I used an example of a, a, found, a startup founded in France, uh, Gorgeous, uh, CEO Romain Lepere. Um, I worked with him to hire a CPO. And um, one of the things that I was extremely impressed with by Romain was that he spent an immense amount of time determining what exactly he wanted in the CPO. And I can't tell you how many people think they know what they want, but they don't know what they want. And so it makes it very hard to find. But Romain went an extra step and interviewed, I would say, a dozen uh, CPOs. Uh, to really figure out what's going to make the best CPO for my organization. So knowing what you want up front is the first and best way to figure out how you're going to find that individual. The second thing is something that I've kind of referred to as a Bible in terms of startup hiring. And it's an article that anybody can look up. The guy's name is John Chin Cuddy. So if you want to find it, you look up um, how Coursera competes against Google and Facebook for talent. 
It was written a while ago. This guy, John, he was a VP of engineering for Netflix uh, before joining Coursera and then moving on to Google. And now I believe he's starting something relatively new at Amazon. Um, but John lays it out very, very clearly that it's about time and energy and effort that the executives need to put into hiring. I'll never forget at Google, the executive team spent 20% of their time, 20% of their time, that's one day a week on hiring, right? Because if you really want to bring in the best people, that's what you need to commit to. And John lays out a phenomenal methodology of how to really reach out and connect with the best people and get them into places that are not as well known as Google, Facebook, or what have you. That's the biggest challenge of, of startups is to get in front of people and get them to understand that you could be just as attractive as one of the big players. So highly suggest taking a look at that article and seeing how uh, John lays that all out. And then finally, the last piece um, is really something that I think everybody needs to think about more and more today, especially because the talent market is so tight in Europe in particular, right? We don't have the dearth of talent that you have in, 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 um, in Silicon Valley. So you really need to personalize and you really need to sell and you really need to spend a lot more time with your candidates. So I was working with a startup um, actually in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a guy named Wayne Crosby. He's the co-founder and CTO of a startup called Humu. And we're hiring a head of design for him. And one of the things that he does that I thought was just brilliant is that he's the first call. He's the first call with the candidate. No matter the seniority, he's the first call and he's not really doing an interview. He's doing a sell, he's doing a pitch. He's making sure he gets to the heart of what that person's really, really interested in and trying to make sure that he can explain to them that they can find that at his company. And so I think that all this goes back to really putting the time and effort into hiring, because if you want to bring the best leaders into your organization, and if you realize that every single leader you bring into the organization can make an enormous impact or can blow everything up then you kind of understand that putting this a time and effort and energy into hiring is something that you really, really need to focus on. David, thank you very much. I totally agree. Um, quality over quantity as well. So next up, we have uh, Sylvie. And Sylvie, you are CEO and co-founder of Lynx Educate. So what is the most interesting challenge that your startup has overcome? Thanks, Adam. So Lynx has a simple but important mission. We help European companies use the power of education to offer greater opportunities for their employees. Today, one of the biggest challenges all companies face, we've heard it, is recruiting and retaining talent. And we all know that it's important to train and upscale employees, but most solutions on the market are just not adapted to the fast changing transformation companies are going through and increasing demands that workers are putting on their employers. And plus, it's just really complicated to organize a comprehensive solution. There's a lot to choose from. Employees often like aren't very engaged, and there's a lot of paperwork and things to organize. So our most interesting challenge in Europe has been to really shift the way that companies think about what it takes to train employees for the future and to think in a strategic way about their reskilling solutions. At Lynx, we're disrupting the status quo of workforce development by responding to two needs. On the one hand, making it easy for companies to get a strategic benefit out of their workforce training. We've curated a learning catalog. We match employees to the programs, provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to boost engagement. And at the same time, our solution provides like real opportunities for employees to grow in their careers and get the most out of the experience. So we overcame this challenge by putting all the pieces together. We partner with top education providers to develop our catalog. We've built a platform to connect employees to those programs and developed a coaching model. And as a result, we've created this ecosystem where everyone is benefiting. Uh, companies are improving retention. They have a tool to attract talent, um, have employees with the right skills, driving a good ROI on their investment in education. Employees benefit from access to quality education and our education partners are able to reach more adult learners. So it just comes down to uh, finding a market need and executing. Sophie, thank you. And uh, next up, Delphine, uh, we can go to you. What is the most interesting challenge that your startup has overcome? So it, it would be great to hear your answer on that. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, well, um, before the health crisis, our progress at GFD toward gender equality has been uneven. and. Uh, even if the 2020 global gender gap report estimated that parity will be reached worldwide in 100 years. 
which means in 2120. So COVID-19 has accented um, the inequalities between women and men in various domains, digital, financial inclusion, education level, employment, leadership, position, etc. And the health crisis has exa exacerbated social, economic, and gender inequalities. So um, women are paying a heavier price as the pandemic was on existing gender inequalities, the lack of women in tech being one of them. Um, so um, digital serves as, as leverage to shape a better future to cope with the coming transformation. So um, as an entrepreneur, what has been uh, the most challenging moment for us was despite, despite the lockdown uh, due to the health crisis, we um, had an event that was uh, um, planned to happen in Paris live with over 6,000 people that was booked to come. And in a matter of a week, when the um, government has announced that everything was um, closing down and we had to lock down, uh, we had to transform um, very quickly to keep our, our clients, our partners, and our public very happy uh, to keep going. And so we, we in one week, um, moved to 100% um, um, physical event to 100% digital event. Uh, we were the only event uh, that uh, kept going. And um, we, because of digital, we increase our partners' audience, build commun community loyalty, and help uh, them reach new targets because we had 200 people connecting to the event where if we did it in digital, uh, it was only 5,000. So we become an even more trusted communication platform to amplify our messages and initiative about gender equality in tech. So the, the biggest challenge was also the biggest opportunity. And, um, and I, I will finish by, yes, indeed, cash is king, but cash flow is queen. And uh, we're very happy to, uh, to announce at the uh, uh, GFD that we are going to, to transform again uh, our, our business even further as uh, I'm uh, getting, getting ready to, uh, to invest and to become a, a business angels. So that's the challenge that we had, that we changed, and uh, we, we took it as, as an opportunity, as being an entrepreneur, of course. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I love it. Yeah, you have to adapt. I was making face-to-face -face events. Now they're online, and they'll be face-to-face -face again. So I love it. You can't control the situation, so just adapt. Um, yeah, take, take the best of it. Exactly. Yeah, um, that, that's the way the world works. And next up, we have Francis, founder and CEO of The Human Company, uh, to talk about your experience in uh, California in the United States. All right. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Francis Scholl. I've lived in the United States and done business for um, more than 20 years um, between New York and Los Angeles um, in California. Um, a few things that we do, we work with uh, startups and we help them. We, have, we work with startups and we work, we work also with corporations, with startups, and we help um, both populations understand that there is the idea, the original you know, impetus to create something, and then there is the scaling challenge. So we developed a model, Squircle, to help the uh, circular aspect of creativity and creating a company and the square aspect of scaling it. So I'm going to send you a link for everyone to take a simple test, squircleacademy.com. Um, um, and it's going to take you three minutes and you will really understand where you're leaning towards structure or more towards improvisation, flow and creativity. So this being said, um, I've got a few words to say of why America remains uh, more than ever uh, a big opportunity for French startups. The first thing is, um, I will say, is that it's, 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 a, it's a country that's extremely entrepreneurial, very innovative. And it's pretty easy to start a business in the United States as an entrepreneur when you're French. There's a visa that's actually quite accessible, doesn't require that much investment. And if you do your work, you'll be able to renew it. So the best countries to start a business, America ranks number four, the number one being Singapore, the number two being uh, Indonesia, but then you can't own a business in Indonesia as a foreigner. Mexico is number three and USA number four. And you don't even need to have an address to start a business and own a business in the United States. The second thing is 
the um, most innovative countries are, we know that uh, Switzerland, America only ranks um, number three again. So Switzerland, Sweden, USA, UK, South Korea, Netherlands. But if you look at the European market that's really innovative, it's only not even 10% of the entire population of the United States. So many more innovators in the United States, of course. And um, where are my notes? The next thing I'd like to say is if we look at the investment, capital is essential to start a business, obviously, and America has 64.7% share of the uh, startups in the world measured in billions of dollars, when China only has 13.8 and India 4.1. So you can see the magnitude of America in terms of opportunities, in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship, capacity to actually um, get into this market, which speaks English, which makes it easy from a legal standpoint. And then of course, the size of the market in terms of consumers. Um, this still remains uh, enormous. So if we compare France to uh, the United States, you have 26% of households in America that make more than $100,000, where you only have 2% in Europe. So you see the ratio 10 times or 15 times more. Um, and that's not only on the East Coast and the West Coast. It's also in Detroit, Michigan, um, you have um, more than 15,000 people who have a capital of an ownership of worth that's more than $5 million um, with um, a strong automobile industry, as you know. Phoenix, Arizona, electronics, semiconductors, you have 14,000 people who have more than $5 million of, of wealth. Seattle, Philadelphia, uh, 16,000. Philadelphia, 23,000 households. So the magnitude of the US market, the ability to scale within one same country in one language that you understand with a legislation that actually will help you and sustain you as an entrepreneur. So that's it. Francis, thank you so much. And um, I'll just share the poll results. Where is everyone based uh, in this webinar? So Paris, 44% of you, uh, but we also have about 30% of you uh, outside of uh, France. So it's a very international audience, um, which is very good to see. And uh, next up, um, we also have a poll about uh, attendee roles. So 48% of you in the audience are founders or CXOs, and 14% of you are investors and venture capitalists. And we also have other people working in marketing, tech, and elsewhere. So next up, we have our venture capitalists and uh, angel investors. And our question for everyone in this section is, given your experience, what tips do you have for French startups and scale-ups getting funding in 2022? And our first speaker will be Romain, uh, co-founder and executive chairman of Cosmo Connected. Uh, Romain, you're also a serial entrepreneur and tech investor. Hi, hi, Dan. hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so, I'm the first who's supposed to give an advice, which is kind of tough. Uh, what I just can say um, is 2022, it's going to be a long year. Uh, what was potentially the tips of uh, in January might be different now. Uh, I think the top priority, if you have a startup and you want to scale up, I think is to make sure that you will have enough cash. Uh, I would say prioritize the cash, try to raise as much as possible and potentially uh, raise it with different, don't take six, six months. If you have a way of doing it earlier, uh, I would suggest to, to do it either if it's an angel investor, or family offices, or even uh, the VC that was not especially the one you, you target. Uh, uh, so that, that would be also a way that we need to, to show resilience. It's gonna be, I think, tough times. And uh, uh, if you have a great, uh, roadmap, if you have a great team, and if you have, I would say, 18, 24 months of cash, well, you can, you can, you, you, will, you can estimate yourself to be lucky. So uh, that, I think, is one of the top priority, uh, it's, if uh, compares to what was maybe different six months ago. And, um, and yeah, I would say try to, uh, to stay humble and try to deploy your plan. Uh, uh, potentially, uh, in six months of time, if you deploy your time, maybe you will get some interest from VCs uh, because you will have shown that you'll be able to uh, to to handle this kind of a difficult period. I don't want to sound I don't want to sound too dramatic, but I think it's realistic to be uh, to uh, in France not to say okay everything is green. Uh, the FOMO period is I think is over, 
so I'd say now it's really t t time to uh, execute, try to bring great talents and uh, show great value as a as CEO and uh, for your, and even if it has to be with uh, uh, with uh, angels and, and I said, you know, it's great to invest with angels. I, I love to invest as an angel also in, in, a, in tech startups, uh, uh, but I think it's important to, to realize that I think cash is, is key. Well, Cash is key. Thank you, Romain. And uh, <laughs> next up, we have uh, Maxime. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next up, uh, Maxime, a founder and managing partner of G Ventures. Hi, Adam. Hi, everyone. And um, yes, Romain, cash is king <laughs> and key, that's for sure. So I'm a serial entrepreneur based in Paris. I'm investing as a business angel since over three years now. And I just recently launched G Ventures, which is the first student VC in France. Basically, we help students and young graduates get to their fundraising round pre-seed seed. And obviously, during this past few, day, few days, few weeks, I've met a lot of founders during office hours, and they were asking me a lot about how they should plan their future fundraising or even the management of their cash right now. Exactly. So basically, what about their hiring? What about uh, their uh, runway? And uh, based on the current stake of the public markets, because obviously on the public markets, it's going down and all the tech values, even the largest, are going down and it's replicate over to uh, all the private equity and now VC stage. So it's important to understand that it's coming up and to get prepared and to plan ahead. So what I did is, and as Web Combinator recommended a few weeks ago, there are some thoughts to consider when making your plans. And I created some of the best advice I found on fundraising in 2022. Uh, and with humility, I will share with you some of the advices I got, uh, nine of them. Uh, first uh, is that no one can predict how bad the economy will get, um, but things don't look good. Like everybody on this panel and on the previous panel told you that it doesn't look good, but still we have a true ecosystem now that we didn't have like 10, 12 years ago in France, in Europe as Maya and Roxanne said. So now we have the resilient infrastructure ecosystem to get through and you have to get prepared. So the safe move, safe move is to plan for the worst. And if the current situation is as bad actually as the last two economic downturns, the best way to prepare is definitely, as Romain said also, to cut cost and um, to extend the runway within the next 30 days so definitely ASAP. And your goal should be to get to default alive. That's for sure. Okay, Maxime, thank you very much. And our next speaker will be Gabrielle, chairman of Leonis Investment. I don't speak French, sorry. Investment is fine. Hey, Adam, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah, thank, you know, thank you, Maxime, for um, kind of um, touching on the Y Combinator recommendation. So Leonis is a French investment club where we allow French individuals to invest in the US. And so obviously uh, most of our investments, I would say 90% are from YC out of, out of the, the, the YC uh, batch, current batch and, and previous batches. Um, and so obviously uh, everyone saw that, uh, that memo from YC, from YC. I wanted to you know, uh, talk about it a little bit as well. Um, a few things, you know, the, 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 the theme of the panel is uh, what advice would you give someone uh, that wants to fundraise in 2022? Well, actually what YC just said, and I potentially could agree is if you're planning on raising right now, don't. That's literally what they said. If you're planning on raising right now, just don't in 2022. Um, so, you know, obviously cash is king. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, quoting Romain uh, uh, and, and uh, extend your runway. That's really what I would focus on. Um, then again, you know, uh, that's all about the kind of negative side, like, okay, don't invest. 2022 is a terrible year. Um, I don't entirely agree. And I do think that for great companies out there, for great businesses that are, you know, growing, that are still growing, there's tremendous uh, uh, raises uh, ahead and tremendous possibilities to raise because it's going to become, um, you know, less crowded, less but you know, uh, Tiger is still investing, Andreessen Horowitz is still investing, 
Leon is, is still investing. I'm not, not in the same category, probably you will see maybe soon. Um, and, and so we're still looking for great businesses. And so I would say the best thing to do, the best advice to reach your, your fundraising goal is to hit your target, is to hit your numbers. You know, if you have the right numbers for a series A, you'll be able to get a great series A. If you have the right numbers for a series B, et cetera. So, you know, um, default to live, uh, reduce, reduce, uh, reduce, sorry, costs, obviously. Um, but also, you know, hitting your, your targets uh, would make for a regular, I would say, raise, even though the environment is kind of messy. I'm sure there's going to be great raises uh, happening and will um, be a part of those um, of those investing still right now. So that's yeah, that's it for, for me. Merci. Thank you. And next up, we have uh, Thie Bogd, uh, CEO of Michelin Venture Capital. So. I'm very, very glad to be here because I'm uh, quite the only representative of what is corporate venture capital. I mean, from a Michelin company, so a large company where we are focusing on mainly uh, Series A, early stage, and, and so on, on startups. So do not hesitate to contact corporate venture capital and do it for fundraising with venture capital uh, because we co-invest, it, it's uh, obvious we we are not alone every day. Uh, and um, and the tips here, I will focus after all what was said about the economics factors, which are quite bad, I would say, uh, on to 2022. I would say to focus on scale, because the the theme of the the, the rapid talk is also about scale up. And I will focus on, on startup, industrial startup, because France has a tremendous opportunity on industrial startups. And the French government launched recently the, the new label for startup industrial. And here, corporate venture capital can help a lot the startup in pre-industrialization and prototypes. It's where we are the best. And, and frankly speaking, uh, uh, we have a, a fantastic opportunity in France to help to, to have startup, industrial startup. Uh, finally, with this uh, new program, we had French tech label. Now we will have French startup industrial. And I think it's a great opportunity, even if the condition economics are bad. But, you know, we will find that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, it's really good to have different parts of the ecosystem here. Um, so next up, we have uh, longer discussions, um, seven minute chats um, with th three international scale ups. The first one is uh, Freshworks for startups. Uh, Sumitra, are you there? Yep, I'm here. <clears throat> Great. Can Sumitra, you hear me? All is good. Yes. Um, can you explain okay. what Freshworks for startups is, please? Sure. Let me first give you an overview on what Freshworks does. So Freshworks is a B2B SaaS enterprise software company. We were born way back in 2010. We are essentially a customer experience and employee experience company. Um, we have seven to eight products ranging from CRM, uh, marketing automation, customer support, um, HRMS and so on and so forth. Uh, recently we got listed on NASDAQ uh, with a public valuation of $14 billion. We started as a small six member team but now close to 5,000 employees across uh, various locations. So that's us, uh, that's what we do. Freshworks for Startups is a two-year-old initiative where the objective is simple. We want to pay it forward. We were also a small company at one point. We are where most of the companies are at this point. So we wanted to pay it forward and help founders scale fast and smart. So as part of this program, we essentially drive three things. Number one is access to products. We give up to $10,000 credits across the suite. Number two is access to engagement with access to leaders, office arts, workshop, content, and so on. And third is access to ecosystem, which is more around real world connections where we do VC Connect, Founder Connect, co-marketing, and so on. And there are good 15,000 odd startups across 87 countries through 1,000 odd VCs and accelerators that we are working with. So yeah, that's Fishworks for Startups. Yeah, and uh, on the point of mentors, why is that so important um, for startups? Yeah, see, it's as simple as, you know, someone who's been there, who's done that, or someone who's been with someone who's been there and done that. Why do you want to repeat the same mistakes, right? So let's repeat some 
other mistake so the point the important point is you know you don't want to be uh taking the same risk which have already been well proven and you know there are solutions for it so a mentor there are two things one a uh, mentor would help you avoid those pitfalls and second a mentor in my opinion knows you better as a context as a company as a business and would be able to navigate you through that situation much better so i honestly feel everybody in life also should have a mentor uh, irrespective you know whether they are doing a company or not so yeah uh, mentors would help you navigate that path much easier yeah and in terms of ecosystems in india in france uh, we talk about startups we talk about investors we talk about mentors what other aspects to the ecosystem do you think are really important yeah i think uh, some of the core elements of you know ecosystem when we look at you know let's say even french ecosystem we work with we work in some capacity with station f with the family and so on so i think the community element where you know you are able to access the relevant folks may it be other co-founder uh, other startups who are, who are doing something relevant or something adjacent to what you are trying to build or access to accelerators or even investors for that matter some of the great speakers out here they have also mentioned how do you navigate that i think uh, community piece is very important that's one uh, second i feel is access to right kind of uh, resources uh, in terms of you know there are there are great companies offering great kind of solutions and uh you know services if you will everybody wants to help startups so there's in my opinion i mean yeah we are looking at uh, you know startup winter and what not but uh, there's no better time to do a startup or build a company out there because everybody has a helping hand out there so yeah resources community and the other points that you mentioned i think that's very crucial when when you are building a company yeah and sumitra sumitra a very big passion of yours is a uh, customer centric startup so what does that mean and how can it be built sure so let me first try to define what customer centricity means so in today's world thanks to the massive connectivity and uh, you know exponential growth in the cloud space it's very easy to become or rather let me say uh, it's very easy to create a digital identity and even internal company so everybody can do that but what we tend to forget is that the power still lies with the end customer so your customer could be reaching out to you across any channel social media even they can visit you physically and so on so they expect that you have the same context irrespective of whichever team you know sales marketing or offline support and whatever they are reaching out to right so you as a business it's very imperative that you need to have a single context and uh, you know single data point across all the customers uh, and any point when they are reaching out to you uh, so that you are able to serve them better for example let's say you are shopping on amazon and uh, you know you have a query around a particular refund request or you know around a product offer or something around that, those lines it's it's expected that amazon knows what's your history been you know how much have you shopped or you know what your queries and so on so it's become all the more important that you even as a small startup um, take care of these things and when you are building out your company the building blocks need to be in one place where you keep customer at the driving seat and build all the functions around that so your sales marketing support need to be talking to each other that's the point when you can expect you having customer centricity yeah i've recently received three or four um i suppose messages emails from people in the same company wanting to meet me so it's nice to have everything in the same system <laughs> um and very quickly um you have a big passion for customer experience can you name one trend that you see at the moment yeah absolutely i i see there are four five trends uh, you know we recently uh, spoke to uh, thousands of customers and you know analyzed millions of queries out there number one is wanted now you know wanted now culture prevails everything so uh, you know the, the faster you are able to respond or serve your customers you will have a better csat point blank period second is uh, you know seamless omni channel experience replaces the patchy uh, i would say physical and digital framework so your customer again could see something on instagram uh, you know they would go on your website end up on your physical store buy something eventually tweet about it and then write you a review so they don't care how you are they are coming your way but they need to have a seamless experience so having that close chain is very important third point is mobile first you know it's it's uh, it's, it's not a news but customer want to control uh, people want to control the pace of the conversation so 
WhatsApp, Line, Apple for Business and whatnot. You know, they want you to be available 24 seven, but don't be intruding. Let me chat and don't call me, right? The fourth piece what uh, we have been seeing is agent empowerment. All the more because of pandemic, it's very crucial that your customer facing team needs to be in a good shape, uh, needs to be happy. They need to be delighted so that they can delight your end customers. And the final piece, Adam, uh, what we have seen is, uh, you know, AI has been in conversation for a while now, uh, but I think being um, automotive, being predictive is prevailing uh, the talk of the town now. So if you want to really exceed in your CX game, uh, you need to, you know, you like it or you don't, you need to jump the bandwagon of boards, AI and these kind of things, because yeah, that will just save a lot of money and a lot of effort for you as a company. Sumitra, thank you very much. Okay, and next up, um, we will go on to John Cutler, Product Evangelist at Amplitude. Uh, John, hello are there. You, are you there? Great. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All good. Great. Okay. Technology. <laughs> yeah, digital products. Great. And um, <laughs> I suppose, John, uh, first of all, you're you're an expert in product, and um, we will do. Uh, product conferences uh, over the coming year in Paris and other cities across France. Um, what is the biggest thing that startups get wrong when it comes to product? Well, I mean, it varies obviously by the type of product, but you know, I would say that not being honest with themselves about the play that they're undertaking. You know, so if they are technical founders who believe they've invented some new and amazing way to do something, uh, they need to lean into that. <laughs> but if they believe that they've discovered some untapped opportunity, they need to lean into the research side and validating that particular problem space. So it, it sounds strange when I say that, but I think there's uh, this is what advisors and other people often help with. I don't think they help with magical skills necessarily, but they give you that other set of ears to make sure that you're being honest with yourself about the play that you're undertaking. Is this going to be something that requires a lot of capital? Is this something that requires early validation? Is this a slow burn type effort? And so I think that um, finding those second set of ears <laughs> to be honest with yourself is, is really the biggest challenge that I see. Great. And most startups in this conference are actually uh, evolving, making their own uh, digital product. Um, how have you seen the category evolve over the past 15 years? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, there's a couple of trends that we've observed. One, it's easier and easier to ship and develop things than it ever has been before. So what used to take quarters to years before can take days or weeks now, not for all plays though, you know, there, there's some plays that are still, you know, you're going to need to kind of work for a year or more to kind of develop your thing, but the rate of being able to deliver. And so we always say at Amplitude, are you shipping faster than you learn or learning faster than you ship? And the pendulum has definitely switched to people being able to ship a lot faster than they learn. 20 years ago or 15 years ago, they would actually learn, there'd be a lot more research, et cetera, accumulating. And then the, the real rate limiter was the ability to deliver and ship. And so I think we've seen the pendulum swing now where teams are actually shipping a lot faster than they can learn. <laughs> and this is, you know, this, this can bite you obviously when you're scaling a startup. Yeah, and I finally read the book, The Lean Startup. People have been telling me for years to read it. <laughs> uh, and that, that focuses on um, basically uh, doing things in batches, doing constant updates instead of yep. doing one big update once a year, which messes up, could mess up everything. Uh, have you seen that as well in Europe? Yeah, and, and I think that, again, everything in context, I mean, Lean Startup was you know, published at a time where a lot of technology plays were extremely big batch plays. I mean, these were people who had been in environments that went for years where there was a, a lot of smoke and mirrors about the success of the startup, and, and Lean Startup was a response to that. What I'm seeing now, again, going back to what we opened with, is that you know, some teams, it's like we've replaced waterfalls with whirlpools. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just shipping, 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 and they're, they're going so fast, and they're not stepping back and looking at the big picture. So I would say that really it depends on the, again, again, on the space that you're in. But what I'm observing is that, I mean, I think the principles in the lean startup are good. I think what's happening is, again, sort of, you'll see teams talking and talking, talking about experiments, but not stepping back 
to the 10,000 foot level and ask what needs to be involved here? You know, what, what, what do we need to ship to be able to validate what we're doing? I don't know if that helps people, but you really need to take a step back. Um, but I think that the idea behind that book is still very valid uh, for what we're doing. Yeah, and do you, do you often see a, um, I suppose, a communication gap between product managers, product designers, and let's say the sales and marketing teams? Yeah, and to me, this is actually the big frontier um, in that what we're actually observing in the, in the Valley, at least Silicon Valley, is that the products and the product thinking around the products is at a certain level, and the product thinking related to sales and marketing is trying to catch up. So it used to be that product was one of the P's of marketing, right? That marketing would evolve, you know, the personas and you'd have this, at least in B2B, you'd have this sales motion and marketing motion and product was being bombarded with all the requests. Now the challenge has flipped where product is very independent and is trying to set the stage for the organization, is moving the organization and sales and marketing is trying to catch up. Uh, catch up. So again, the, the pendulum has switched. Now, I don't know for many of the stages of the startups that are listening to this, this, you know, this might be a little too early to discuss that, but the more you can apply product thinking, experimentation and an opportunity focus and long-term strategy across your engineering and design and sales and marketing team, that, will, that can definitely be a competitive advantage because often the hypothesis to test isn't over on the product side. It's actually in the sales and marketing side. And so you need to be able to apply the same thinking to those particular areas. It's, it's definitely a challenge, especially if you're a veteran of a very fast moving tech company and now you've started a startup, your comfort zone is the shipping, shipping, shipping your comfort zone is not so much the sales and marketing side. So that might be where you have to focus actually. And John, um, we're looking at doing chief product uh, officer conferences across Europe in the coming months. Um, it's a term that 13,000 people have in uh, Europe according to LinkedIn, which is a, a lot <laughs> less, yeah, a lot less than uh, in the United States. Um, so why are chief product officers necessary? How are they different from existing positions in Europe? Uh, why should a startup have one basically? Well, if you think about a lot of startups, if one of the founders came from a product background, you essentially have a chief product officer, whether you like it or not. Um, but as things start to scale, but let's say you don't, you know, some people are very entrenched in a certain domain, they're experts in that, they found a company, and they never really learned product. They're very passionate about the domain. They might know sales, they might know marketing, they might know general business. They might even come from a consulting background or big five consulting, any range of things. And so the CPO role is either filled by a founder with a product background, or that will need to be a key hire for the company. Now, at first it might not be a CPO, it just might be a head of product. It might be some, you know, the, the title is rather unimportant actually in the grand scheme of things. But I think what this is saying is that you need someone at the highest level of leadership who understands the power and potential of design, data, and technology to create outcomes for the business, create outcomes for the customers, et cetera. So in Europe, especially in a lot of the larger, you know, established public companies, they don't have that person. And so you get this divide between the business and IT or engineering or product development, et cetera. And that is a critical gap for those larger companies. That, that's why these startups, you, you all have opportunities because the people you're trying to disrupt still haven't figured out how to bring product thinking to that level in the company. And so that's sort of what I'm seeing is that you have to ask that question. Do we have someone at the most senior level of leadership in the company who understands the power of design data and technology to create outcomes for the business, sustainable outcomes for the business? And it really helps to have someone in that role um, because it's a superpower <laughs> and that's, that's why you need it. So if you're a founder who doesn't have that background, definitely start thinking about how to bring that in or learn. And if you're a founder who does have that background, remember, it's hard to be a founder and your CPO at the same time <laughs> because you get torn. You know, it, it, it can founders don't necessarily make the best CPOs because they can't get out of their own heads. So, you know, it helps to hire someone who can do that. Yeah, and actually, um, I think a, a big difference with Europe as well is there's a, a lot more focus on B2B 
Uh, whereas in the yeah. United States, there there are more B two C companies. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. definitely true. I think that um, and, and related to that as well, in in B two B, you often have that person at founded the company who has a very strong domain knowledge for the business domain that they're trying to get involved in, and that is both a both a blessing and a curse. It, it could mean that they're very knowledgeable about the domain, but don't necessarily know how to use design data and technology to create those outcomes. And, and in my workshops, actually it's European companies and B2B that often have the hardest time with a domain oriented founder with embracing more product type thinking. So it's something to think about. Hey, John, very interesting to talk with you about product. Um, next up, we have uh, Samantha uh, Richardson from Twilio. Hi, Adam. Hello from New York this time. Oh, fancy. <laughs> yeah. Hi, John. Yeah, hello from Dublin. <laughs> it's not fancy at all. Uh, well, look, Samantha, you're also focused on products, so um, this is going to be pretty interesting. I'm sharing the results now of the poll, but you'll see, uh, yeah, 50% of people here are B2B, and then 37% are both. Uh, is this something you see more, um, I suppose, more startups going into B2B and B2C. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think that part of it is this huge shift towards direct customer or direct consumer, which um, we seem to be having conversations about on a daily basis at the moment. You know, whatever the size of the organization and Twilio works with, um, we're an API platform. So we work with everybody from startups, very early startups, right the way through to large enterprises. And, um, but, but the trends are the same, which are, People really want to move direct to customer because they can now. They want that data. The data is gold. So having that data about the company or the um, consumer that you're interacting with and who's your customer is vital. The second is that the way people are communicating now um, very very much is, is reflecting that B2C space. So what we're seeing is far more of a use of WhatsApp business, not just for direct customer but also um within a b2b scenario as well because you know it's an easy and effective way to communicate and i think that sunitra mentioned it earlier it's the kind of want it now culture whether that be again for consumers or businesses we're all humans at the end of the day we, we it's the want it now and and part of that is respond to me now give me the answer now um, so yeah, we, we're seeing a, a, a huge drive towards more of these instantaneous engagement channels. Yeah, and it's funny, we announced the WhatsApp group at the start of this uh, webinar. It already has 100 people, and I suppose that's B2B. I, I know uh, a few years ago in the Middle East, um, people would use WhatsApp for business, but in Europe, that was not the case. But do you see that changing yeah. a bit? Yeah, it's rapidly yeah. catching up. Yeah. Yeah, so Definitely. Samantha, you might be able to see the poll that I'm doing here in terms of uh, customer engagement. Uh, obviously, most people here are B2B, so we should yeah. keep that in mind. Um, yeah. But I, I consistently see LinkedIn come out on top of email. Uh -huh. um, what's your opinion on that? Do you think that's a big shift? I mean, I, I guess it's within the context, and I guess that people are using that like for promotion and marketing and networking perspective. Um, I mean, it, it, it is a, a bigger shift that we, we are seeing this consistently, that it's being used kind of, um, I suppose, in the way in which we started to use all of the social channels. Again, there's this blurring because people want to connect with people where they are in the channels that they're using most often. Um, as I say, whether that is just because of the, the particular um, audience that we've got at the moment and their, their drive to be actually connecting with people that can help them grow their business is, is interesting. I also see that email is really high and um, email is, you know, everybody has predicted, been predicting the demise of email on phones for ages and it just doesn't happen because they are really convenient channels to use. I think the problem starts with email where people, uh, again, aren't on it instantaneously. They're not giving the right kind of um, response to it. Um, Jan, who was very wise, and I've taken lots of notes from him earlier, was talking about being really lean as a business, especially as we potentially hit more of these bumpy times. And I think that that's so important. 
Like if you're not responding quickly, fixing problems, ironing out all of the creases that you've got potentially within your service offering, then that adds a huge amount of uh, cost and volume into your offering, into, into your organization. And an email, if you're not careful with it, can really drive some of that volume because it, it, it's the way companies think about it is it's not the most responsive. It can also go on and on and on as you go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. So I think that email is great for like long form content or something that you know a, a customer or a business needs to say. But think about really spreading that use across other channels because um, it does have a tendency to to create this backup and really add add some volume and. Um, create inefficiencies in an organization is the only thing i'd say yeah great and uh, i suppose on the topic of communication methods what do you think is the most underused one for example website chat something like that yeah it's difficult because sorry if you can hear noise in the background it's difficult because um it, it it depends it's that really annoying phrase it depends because it does depend on your organization um i think that web chat is underused but then it, or, or perhaps it's not used very well because people build um automation into it that actually just ends up in frustration and cul-de-sacs so i think having that ability very quickly to jump off and speak to a human is very important i know that you know the phone is a costly thing but there's ways that you can automate it and put fantastic IBR automation, you know, for something that really requires a depth and in-depth response or a very immediate response, it can be, you know, don't shy away from having it because you can make huge leaps in terms of resolving problems and increasing that CSET score and increasing loyalty by really making that human connection with somebody. As always, I think it's just do your research. Do your research and really understand where your customer is. You know, there's such a plethora of ways that you can communicate with them. The most important thing is to um, take that 10,000 foot view, as John was talking about, understand what your service is, what are those connection points, what are the escalation points, and, and where your customers are and what channels that they're using. And I think that, that that's the best way to make sure that you're, you're hitting the right notes. Don't just go for... A standard sms email you know be intentional about what you're designing yeah no thanks and um just a bit of feedback i suppose uh everyone almost everyone here has um got outreach from me on linkedin um but yeah with twilio um actually with twilio software i i i used to work for a company and it was this is crazy but i know it sounds weird but um listen up basically uh i worked for a company that sold online courses uh, to doctors and uh, they have this amazing sales method where, where doctors are very busy people. So once somebody filled in a form on a website, we would call them within one or two minutes. Now, that, that sounds kind of um, people might be freaked out, but actually people were very impressed. They were doctors. Yeah. They, yeah, so they came into the CRM and then we called people using Twilio software um, and actually uh, <laughs> had great conversations. But if I called those people just one hour later, um, probably they wouldn't remember what the program was. So yeah, uh, exactly. I, I, I'm probably going to send out a text message. We're going to do a European startup Slack group maybe, and we're just going to text yeah. message of 10,000 people. So uh, let's see what happens. I know I know text messages apparently have a 20%, 20 uh, open rate, whereas an email might have a one or 2% open rate. I think it's interesting because um, SMS used to have like a 98% open rate overall you know people tend to open very quickly so it's probably about 20 25 percent um an instantaneous open i think the problem is because it's being so saturated with like marketing messages and things like that it, it's going the way of many channels and people are just looking at it going oh, no, it's spam so we're not going to open it so be very careful about what it is you're communicating and and the content design is, is as important as it ever was I think those are the two things that people tend to overlook but how you communicate and what you're communicating can just it, it drives your loyalty you know product will only go so far on its own it's everything else that you're building in with that that will really make the difference 
Okay, well, Samantha, thank you very much. Uh, we now have our final speakers, um, really appreciate it. So our next set of speakers are actually based in the United States. Um, uh, they're gonna give a very interesting uh, perspective about doing business there. So our first speaker in this section uh, will be Rai, uh, founder and CEO of Club and Takeoff Labs. What can France learn from Silicon Valley? Uh, thanks a lot, Adam, for the invite. Um, I'm actually based in Paris, but uh, um, basically, Club is a U.S. company, so our mission is to help creators make a living. Uh, the interesting thing, I think, is that uh, we were born during uh, the first lockdown of COVID, and uh, we're a U.S. company with U.S. investors. Uh, my co-founders are American as well, uh, but I'm based in Paris, and most of the team is based in Paris, but our main market is in the U.S. as well. Um, so it actually means that it's possible. And one of the reasons why I decided to mostly raise uh, with uh, US investors, I mean, I have like two French investors, like Kima Ventures and an angel, uh, Alexei, but uh, uh, just because uh, I believe that in the US, the relationship I would have with the uh, US investors is very different uh, than the relationship that I would have with French investors. And because I believe that most of the investors in the US, I mean, the one that I raised with are former founders. So like the relationship is very different because you can actually relate, they can actually relate uh, with you. And because they've been through all the tech design, uh, building and company and all the process um, and all the ups and downs as well. So I believe uh, what I would love to see in, in the French ecosystem is just like more investors coming from uh the the founder side um and i believe if they would come like from the founder side i think they would have more empathy to the to the founders as well and they would understand our needs a lot better and would be able to like uh do a better job in helping us like learn faster all right thank you very much uh actually very good info in just a couple of minutes um so next up we have kevin co-founder and ceo of braid health Hey, uh, yeah, um, so same question, I assume. Yeah, what, what can France learn from Silicon Valley? It's very broad, so answer it as you wish. Yeah, uh, well, I have a, sh a short answer, which is uh, that nothing is really impossible. Uh, and I think that's something that I really feel here um, and uh, that, that we infuse in, in Braid Health, in our company, uh, in like reinventing healthcare for everyone and, and um, you know, working even with the uh, Fortune One company, uh, Walmart Health, right? Uh, a company of ten people, uh, and and so those sort of things, you know, winning against like the giant Goliath and and so on was, uh, would be considered you know, a bit insane, uh, but you know we went at it. And if you look at really like the things that uh, made a difference uh, in the in in the you know, unicorn billionaire um, and and so on, uh, those were a company that really uh, you know shifted the way you would think about. Um, what is um, what is possible? So, uh, but then uh, it's also not far. So I you think that uh, something really good between France and the U.S. is just like six-hour flight, and you know, I engage and invite everyone to like you know, check it out, and also check out Europe and check out the world as a whole. Right? It's, it's nice, definitely uh, shifting to a more decentralized model ourselves as a company with employees in, in Turkey and in Germany. So we're we're uh, not even uh, I would say a U.S. company anymore. We're uh, really a global company. All right. Well, Kevin, merci. Thank you for the advice. And uh, the the next three speakers, the question will be, why should French startups go to the United States? Uh, so next up, we will have then uh, Arcadi Lapiro, uh, CEO and founder of Agora Services. Hi, guys. Um, I'm French, based in New York. So Lapiro, the way you say it was like, uh, like Spanish, but uh, <laughs> I'm good with it. Um, so I'm the CEO of Agua, which is a fintech. So why a French uh, startup should go to the U.S.? Uh, I will make like a like a pitch uh, uh, pitch taker for raising capital. It's like a, uh, the market is big, uh, consumers large, uh, easy to make money. So that's a traditional traditional deck for, that a lot of uh, traditional fintech states. Why French should go to the U.S. Um, first, should they? Uh, it's a big market, one language, one currency, one tax code. Um, 
the thing it's like uh, if you're coming as a B2C player, forget it. It's a totally different habits, different different consumer uh, ratio. Uh, why they should go here? It's like mostly if a B2B, if they have a product which is a B2B that can be scaled, that uh, uh, that can be with a reseller reseller mode, definitely they should take a look at it. If you're looking at fintech, uh, not French, but uh, large. Uh, Challenger Bank from uh, from Europe came here by saying it's of the golden space of the radar like N26, Monster Revolut, uh, they're all failing. Um, I wrote from the beginning, but N26 got failure here, they failed. So if you're a French startup, if you're looking at the US, just consider and take a look at the market. Do you have a B2B product scalable? And uh, if yes, come here, uh, that's a place to be. Hey, Arcadi, thank you. And yeah, I speak Spanish, not French, so <laughs> that, that, that explains the pronunciation. Um, thank you. So the next speaker is Mehdi, a founder at Alias.dev and API Days. Yeah, you, you're calling me, Adam? Yeah, I can hear you. Well, I, uh, have a, I, have a, I have a child who is singing, so this is why I was <laughs> trying to keep myself muted for, for longer. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you repeat the question? Uh, yes, the question is, um, why should French startups go to the United States? Uh, no, yes, as someone said earlier, uh, to be global since day one, you know, the goal, especially we're, we're doing developer tools uh, with, uh, and so all the alpha developers, the mindset, the top engineers, even the COVID-19 like, uh, 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 and, and people are working remotely, the spirit is still there. And the goal is, yeah, when you want to be at the heart of a tech scene, you have to be in this heart of tech scene. And, and even if people are working remotely, this is still the place to be, as someone said earlier, for especially in the tech and dev tools, you know, this is still where decisions are made. If you want to be just a user, go in Europe, in Asia, whatever. If you want to talk to the builders who are building the product and be part of it, of uh, te large tech companies and, 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 uh, and, um, and it's uh, inspire developers of the world. Yeah, this is the place to be definitely. Thank you very much. And uh, next up, we have Benjamin, uh, founder and CEO of Journey Business Plans. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess to the point of, um, you know, of everyone else who spoke about the U.S., it's true that it's kind of the common pitch deck uh, comment, market size. I think responsiveness to, to marketing of the consumer market, I, I do believe B2B and B2C can can exist and startups can come in B2C as well. It's true that fail rate is, is higher, but it really depends on your culture. And, and I think here um, it's about being able to pivot faster. Compared to France, you have uh, the ability and the flexibility to hire in a, in a market that is a lot more flexible. You're not entirely you know, tied and you can, you, can, you can renew your culture and you can meet more talent and be on the map when you're in the US and attract a lot more talent, even if, if it's throughout the world. Um, and, and ultimately, if you pass the test of, you know, scale, speed, and customer experience, which you have to, you know, to really address when you come here, uh, then, you know, if you, if you feel you're mature enough as a company to get there, I think uh, that's when you should, you should move to the US. It will also put you on the map for VCs, as, um, you know, you were saying, some of the panelists were saying in the past, um, investors here, are also past founders, so that you know they're builders, and if you're if you're in that uh, mode of scale, it does you know put you on the global map for sure. Okay, well, Benjamin, as our final speaker, thank you for closing the event. Really appreciate it. Um, I will say to everyone still listening, thank you for coming. If you want to share your uh, LinkedIn, um, you can actually chat on the chat box now uh, just to finish the event. Uh, feel free to add me. I'll, we'll be doing um, the Paris Startup Meetup uh, on June 27th. And during September or October, we will do a series of events for CMOs, CTOs, CPOs, every three uh, letter initial you can think of. So thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. And uh, see you in Paris. Thank you.